Hey STEM enthusiasts! Welcome back to Cameron's Lab, Dive In, the go-to podcast for STEM students. Craft it with passion by one of your own. I'm Cameron, your enthusiastic and ever-curious host. Buckle up for today's insightful episode. Ready to dive in? Hi everyone, welcome back to Cameron's Lab. Today I am happy to be joined by Miss Siobhan Clark-Joel. She's a fellow Bermudian, so I'm really excited to have her today. Just to give you a quick introduction to her, she is a data protection professional who was recently featured in the 100 Brilliant Women in AI Ethics for 2024. Wow. <laughs> she has about six years of experience in the field of tech. And outside of that, so she's like a double-edged sword, she also is very in- involved in the arts. So she mentioned before that she would, she's also looking at playwriting. She has her Master's of Arts from Kingston University and also so much more experience there. So I'm really excited to learn about that as well. So, Ms. Clark Joel, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to have you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I did want to kind of start off with what you mentioned before. So looking at this double-edged sword, like I mentioned, of doing arts and technology at the same time. So if you wouldn't mind explaining a little bit more about what you do. And yes. Yeah. Um, so when I, when, I think of, when I think of the age of AI, um, I, I think of it as a time when we need to marry arts and science. Um, and that's something that, uh, has been staple in my life for, for my entire life, to be honest. When I think of my career, and so I talk quite a bit about mapping our journey. And so if, we're, if I look at the early, um, early childhood, and I think of shows like, I don't know if you remember, because um, I may show my age here a little, but it's okay. But Fraggle Rock. I don't know if you've heard of Fraggle Rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you know Muppets or the Muppet okay. Gate. Yes, yeah. so it's like a step above Muppet. <laughs> but anyway, Fraggle Rock was a popular um, cartoon. Well, not really a cartoon, but a Muppet show uh, when I was uh, a child. And Fraggle Rock had a, a, a female character that uh, went by the name of Red. Red was outspoken, adventurous. Um, she was ahead of her time in terms of females and having a voice. And so for me, um, number two to my mom, who's also a strong female, <laughs> um, Red really helped me to, to start forming a voice that early and to understand how art and technology through the television at that start, right? How it could come to light. Right. And then when um, as, as I continued on, uh, cartoons that also st- are staple in my childhood, the Jets, um, you know, the, I'm sure you know of the Jets. Yes, I think that one. <laughs> but one you may not uh, be so familiar with was called Galaxy High School. Now, the Jets, you can already connect the dots. Right. Um, it was an intro to uh, technology in, in, in mainstream through this cartoon. And so um, really being able to see robots coming to life and, you know, with the made robot and virtual conversations with uh, Jane and her husband and, you know, flying around in space mobiles and things of that <laughs> sort. That was exciting to me. So whereas, whereas some young people might have gravitated towards the Flintstones, I was more for the Jets. So the Flintstones is a more primitive type of what it was like yesteryear. <laughs> <laughs> now, Galaxy High School takes it to another level. And this is going to start connecting a bit of dots with my background. Um, so Galaxy High School, you can already imagine it was intergalactic. It was, um, you know, so we, diversity and inclusion 2.0, right? <laughs> 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 All sorts of lives that were sure. together. Um, learning from each other. Um, it wasn't called AI technology in the mainstream back then, mm-hmm. but examples of that in education was, was, pre- you know, was, was prevalent in this show. Like it was a lot of, um, exposure to what the world would look like through the eyes of a student and through learning. And so, um, You know, these are things that kind of started to wet my palate, so to speak, uh, when it comes to technology as well as art. But I I didn't know at the time that that would form, you know, who I am today and what I do today. The work that I do today is a bridge between data protection, artificial intelligence, 
um, more so around the realm of ethics. And so I entered AI through data protection. Um, while living in the UK, um, I worked at a law firm. They sent me on to do GDPR and I became a GDPR practitioner. Um, and of course, this general data protection regulation. Um, and so from there, I left that uh, law firm and I started in consultancy. Um, I worked with small, mid-size and large sort of nationwide businesses or national businesses. And so um, one of my, um, one of the staples of my career, believe it or not, was an experience working with a Bermudian uh, connected uh, tattoo parlor in Birmingham. Um, it was a small mom and pop type of shop, as you can imagine. And this creative studio, I worked very closely with them, um, you know, with training around data protection, helping them to really put some understanding around how, uh, how many risks could come into their establishment. So really marrying uh, art and technology in that way. And that's why it was, um, you know, one of the uh, most exciting pieces of work that I've done because I'm, I'm an artsy part person. Um, as you mentioned, um, you know, I wrote my first song around eight years of age. I'm a poet, playwright. Um, I've published books um, and I've had numerous stories in the Royal Gazette Christmas Story. I've been, I received the Crystal Butterfly um, um, Artist Award in Bermuda uh, for female artists. And that was a huge honor because it was alongside um, some really magnificent female voices in Bermuda, literary uh, voices in Bermuda. Um, I think what really made my work stand out was the was that um, it was the first piece of work. It was called Burmy Chick Chronicles, was uh, sort of the series. And um, it was a series of books that was very down to earth, very much um, in your face, which is the type of writer I am. My plays, my poems, everything is straightforward. <laughs> That's just how I am. Um, and uh, so, yeah, like the, this series of books at the time, there was no local books that really spoke about social ills in Bermuda. And so uh, leaning on my psychology background, uh, cognitive neuroscience and criminal justice, um, it, it, it certainly kind of paves the way with a lot of the work that I've done. So whether that's in the artsy side um, or if it's more to do with technology, arts and science is everything in this day and age. So true. I like what you said at the beginning about um, looking at the Jetsons and just being introduced to that futuristic next next level kind of technology is really what inspired you to be able to merge both of those. I think I had similar experience with my grandfather, Kenyatta Young, for those who don't know, trade unionist. But he would always introduce me to Star Wars and show me all the movies. And then he would have me follow him around the house of a screwdriver. And I'm just like, okay, Paul, like changing the outlook covers. <laughs> but and that's why now I do like engineering. It's, it's, it's that little things, you know, gems or breadcrumbs, little things that, that we learn. And that's what I mean by mapping our journey. You know, often we get to a place in our lives where we don't know what we want to do next or we're, we're stuck. You know, many students are listening. And I worked as student recruitment officer at Bermuda College for five and a half years. And I worked at King's College London um, as the postgraduate um, uh, program manager. And so working with students, I'm quite familiar and comfortable with. And I know that what we study in university may not be our career. And like I said, I studied psychology, criminal justice, cognitive neuroscience, believing I would be a forensic psychologist. It didn't happen. It just was not in the cards for me. But instead, I can now take the arts and science, which, of course, that falls under liberal arts or arts and science. I can take that knowledge and apply it as an AI ethicist, if you see what I mean. And so nothing is erased. But if you want to figure out what's your life's purpose, go back and map some of your experiences and start at child, you know, with childhood. I like that. Go back and map your experiences. Write that one down, everyone. That's a good question <laughs> later. <laughs> um, that's actually perfect, especially at the end. I liked how you were talking about, you know, that, that art degree and how you were bringing in your own voice, that impactful voice of not, I guess, shying away from the topics that most people might say, maybe I shouldn't talk about that. And you're like, no, impact. Like, we need to bring it to the lights. So I, I really appreciate that about yourself. 
I've, I've always been about giving people a voice. I have a big voice, mm-hmm. right? Like I said, I was young and, and, a, you know, spotlight person, not that I felt comfortable, but sometimes you don't feel comfortable, but you keep getting pulled into this direction and you start to realize that it's bigger than your comfort is what you're meant to do. Right. And so for, um, for, for me having a big voice and knowing and understanding and loving and, and, um, learning people who don't have such a big voice, I think I have a, have work to do, if that makes sense. And that is everything even leading to the AI ethicist, um, you know, ethics work that I do now. Yeah. And speaking of the AI ethicist work that you do now, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit more about your work now. So from your very long, might I say, LinkedIn experience list, I wanted to ask you a bit more about the cybersecurity GDPR kind of side of everything. I only recently started getting into AI ethics, thanks to Miss Anna Bulak, an episode we had previously. Quick plug, if you want to go listen to that. But um So just kind of learning a little bit more. So if you wouldn't mind describing your experience of how you started getting into that, especially moving from, like you said, psychology, that whole neuroscience, forensic psychologist, how did you go into then AI ethics and security? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the first thing that I would say is your undergraduate degree is just a stepping stone for life, Mm -hmm. for your careers in life, right? Um, Transferable skills is what you always need to think about. So I kind of put aside criminal justice, cognitive neuroscience for a period of time. And I really leaned on psychology because psychology, um, it has a lot of um, opportunity in it, right? Um, No matter what you do, if you work in customer service, there is a bit of psychology. If you work in operations, which is where I did quite a bit of, um, of work and experience. And so what happened with me is... Um, after finishing my undergraduate degree, um, I was kind of promised an opportunity that fell through. And so, you know, you can only sit for so long, lick in your wounds, especially as a single parent. So I had a, I had a little kid at the time and, um, reality set in. So I started taking roles because I needed to pay bills, but I only gave every role around two, two and a half years. The longest role was Bermuda College, as I mentioned, as student recruitment officer, because I loved the idea of inspiring and ins- and empowering other people. I am a lifelong learner. Anyone who looks on my LinkedIn, they could see how many certifications I've done. And there's a whole story about that. It's just been wide open. So that's a lesson in whatever life throws you, wherever you find yourself, make it work. So bringing it back to the topic of career, um, my psychology, I embarked on numerous work experiences. Going into um, moving to the UK, um, I first did my master's degree uh, in playwriting again um, through Kingston University, London. I wanted to do, my first degree was for the purpose of profession, <laughs> and it didn't work out <laughs> the way I thought it would. So my second degree, I wanted to do something I loved. I said, you know what? I want to be passionate about it. And so I embarked on a, on a degree in playwright. Now, I don't write plays on a regular basis. That was never my passion or interest camp. Instead, it was really around understanding people. Because remember, I'm a people person. So when you're a playwright, the things that I've been able to kind of grab and transfer into my career projection has been things like understanding creative ways of communicating with of um, vulgarizing information or taking complex information and simplifying it. You would do that, right? Learning how to write briefs. Um, in playwriting, it's very technical writing. So understanding those dynamics have been instrumental in my career in data protection, um, as well as, like I said, being agile, being nimble. This is what you need to be as a, um, as a professional leader in this day and age. And let's not forget the diversity and inclusion that any type of art degree would bring to someone. My son is studying his master's degree in dance movement psychotherapy. So this belief of using art as a form of healing and as a way of expression and teaching and growing is something that I believe and I encourage any young person, if they have an artsy background, don't ignore it and think you have to put it aside. For, for a more, you know, um, STEM type of career. Think about how you're going to merge it. Because like I said, that is a skill for now and for the future. 
Going into GDPR was through the law firm, as I mentioned. Uh, they sent me off. I thought nothing of it other than opportunity because um, I always think of, you know, how can I make this work? <laughs> and so I went off and it was an aha moment, Ken. It was a moment that I realized every bit of experience in banking, in uh, pharmaceutical shipping, on supply chain management. In, um, in, in, um, insurance. I worked for a stint at an insurance firm. And yes, in education, how all of that bring it together, how this makes sense in data protection, right? Because I could go into data protection and I can tell you in a heartbeat across numerous industries where the risks lie. Where, how can they be creative to address certain dynamics in an industry and the size of an organization. Because I've worked for small organizations, like I said, to larger entities. I've also been an entrepreneur. I've had three businesses. Um, the last business was um, called TLC, Group of Companies. And it is, um, it's based on cybersecurity and data protection. So when I was in the UK, like I said, I went into GDPR. I did um, a bit of time as a consultant, gauge, gaining experience. The large multinational company, uh, they had a number of hotels, um, restaurants, um, guest houses, apartment buildings. And so my role, and it was all across the UK um, and Ireland. And so my role was to, one, develop a, a robust data protection framework for the entire entity. Um, two, to train every individual that worked in. Now, you can imagine the UK and all of those entities. I got a lot of experience training. <laughs> <laughs> I also had to create um, maps for um, each, um, each entity, because remember, they stand alone, even though they're under the umbrella of the company. But they would have stood alone, the restaurants, the apartment buildings, these hotels, and they would um, purchase grade A buildings, gorgeous old antique buildings, and convert them into these um, more modern uh, uses. And so um, I gained a lot of experience. They did everything in-house camera, everything from social media to the receptionists at the, res at the hotels to um, the website management to the architects. The construction workers, <laughs> everything was in everything, house. everything. And they had partnerships with like health um, care entities, um, with uh, entertainment agencies, with shelters, like charities. So I literally had an opportunity to stretch my experience across all of these entities. Coming back to Bermuda for the purpose of being with family. I thought that I would come back and continue my consultancy, but no one knew anything of what I was talking about there. GDPR was foreign and everyone felt, well, they can't touch me. I'm in Bermuda. And I could not get them to understand what extraterritoriality means. <laughs> that if, if a person is, is from the UK or lives in the UK and they're in Bermuda, they are protected by GDPR. So even in another country under GDPR, you have to make sure that you have policy in place and, and operations needs to match that policy. Um, there are a lot of risks by not paying attention to the interoperability <laughs> or, you know, the, um, I call it like, uh, the extra arms of data protection is a lot to pay attention in that space. Um, so I came back to the island, uh, and, uh, no one knew I was talking about, uh, I, I had a Bermudian girl in Birmingham that reached out and said, hey, I do cybersecurity, you do data protection, why don't we work together? And it was another friend who I used to teach with. So the three of us formed the TLC group, and we created, we changed our business model, we had to pivot immediately. So again, you have to be agile, you have to be nimble in this day and age for yourself as a professional and as a business owner. And so those of individuals looking to go into entrepreneurship always think, you know, how can you remain as agile and nimble as possible? Um, so anyway, we became more of a training provider. We created Bermuda's first certified privacy officer, um, foundation and practitioner courses, 
uh, privacy leads and privacy champion courses. Um, we started um, working with Bermuda's community. I was often called because at the time the privacy commissioner's office had not been developed. So I was often called to do a lot of the panels and to give advice around data protection and things of that sort. Um, and we really created um, a noise in Bermuda. We started advocating for data protection for, for Bermuda's Piper because it exists. <laughs> yeah. um, so a lot of my cybersecurity um, work and research and study and certification really came around when I started working and partnering with Tahira Lovell, who is still the CEO um, and co-founder of the TLC Group. Um, she has a very strong, she's a CISO, so she has a very strong cybersecurity background. Um, very quickly, I understood the holistic dynamic of data protection, cybersecurity, and data privacy. So I like to say privacy is the legalities. So if you're interested in legal privacy, that's privacy, right? Data protection is more of the technical, the practicalities, right? Mm -hmm. How do you put it into practice? And then you have security. So it could be cyber or physical space security. And so these are things that holistically every organization needs it. Every entrepreneur needs to consider it for their businesses. And so that's kind of how I started getting into cyber security developing training and things of that sort. Working, um, before I went off to London, I also worked in education, um, teaching at, at Clearwater and Barclay. Um, while at Barclay, I was asked to create the curriculum of career development program. I'm not a teacher by trade, and that is something that many teachers don't know how to create, right? Like um, lesson planning is very different to curriculum development. And so I worked um, very closely under the mentorship of Sandra Burroughs, who was the deputy principal at Barclay. That really um, has helped in my career with training, development, um, and really making sure that it's aligned with the audience. Wow. I, got, I must admit that that opportunity that you had in London where you were basically branching out into all the different industries, like you had your pick of yeah. how many industry you wanted to work in. It was, and it was you know amazing. Cameron, you know, when I left Bermuda, I'll tell you this because I think it's important. When I left Bermuda, when I was working in Bermuda, like I said, I'd give every business about two, two and a half years, <laughs> and then I was gone, <laughs> right? Um, but I was ashamed. I left the Bermuda feeling as if I had a colorful resume. But the first time I sat with a recruiter in London, and they looked at my resume, they were blown away. And they said, wow, I could put you anywhere, like you said, Cameron, mm -hmm. because I had worked across all of these industries. So I gained experience that numerous entities, um, Anglo-American and big, you know, um, well-known types of entities in the UK, as well as, again, establishing my foot to start my own business. I had a relocation business um, but when I was working, when I was living in the UK as well. I wanted people, Bermudians particularly, but people who did not necessarily have the skills or know-how to advocate for themselves in the process of relocation, I wanted to give them a platform and a voice. And so for years, I had Reloconnect for that purpose of giving a piece of my experience to help others to grow. And again, all of this, as you can tell, goes hand in hand with the advocacy in AI um, ethics. I love it. It all goes, it's all linked together. Like you said, it's all mapped together. Map we'll together. see with mapping it together. <laughs> and I especially was really enjoying what you were speaking about being an entrepreneur, just especially being an entrepreneur's daughter. My mom, <laughs> she had her own business, kicks, get the control systems, not a plug, but you know, just saying. Not a plug, <laughs> so, um, excuse me. Definitely a plug. You better plug. Definitely a plug. <laughs> like, good thing. Workshops are coming up, everyone, if anybody's listening. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it's just listening to that entrepreneurial spirit, really just, you know, being agile, having to pivot, gaining so many different skills. It's, it's really inspiring to listen to another entrepreneur. It's like, it's really, I love that. Um, it also does bring me back to what I wanted to talk about later, which was, um, asking you a little bit more about that giving back. So I guess, how would you say that your own career, like when you, you already mentioned that you've been able to give back by giving other people a voice, but, how else would you say that you're, I guess, just sharing your knowledge, really? How else would you say that you're able to give back to other people? Yeah. Do you know what? Um, in all fairness, I've, I, I would say that um, 2023 was a year of reflection and introspection for me. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I had to do a lot of shadow work, if you're familiar with that. Um, so on a spiritual level, the kind of facing um, your good and your bad, right? Because when we show up in the world, we show up as whatever we believe good should look like. <laughs> but we live with ourselves. And you know what? I'm, if you're a religious person, Jesus Christ, a God shows anger, right? Jealousy. <laughs> all the things that we deem to be so negative, God has all of those things. And so they're all in us. And so I did a lot of work around that. And that helped me to fully appreciate and understand my space and my voice. Years ago, so like I said, from my early childhood, writing, my art is writing. All right. So that's my um, God given talent, if that makes sense. Um, and I found a lot of peace and and um, expression in writing. I used to do spoken word, uh, which is stick, a plug, which is stick for me. <laughs> that's for me. That back in the day, I was called spoken, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and so, but I learned through doing spoken word that I'm not a spoken word artist, I'm a poet. It's a softer side of writing, isn't it? Um, I can be forceful in my personality, as you see, is quite lively. But when I go to take the mic, I immediately get into a formal <laughs> stance. Of that, like, I'm pushing out. I'm just done that. <laughs> so a lot of lesson about self. And so when we talk about giving back in the forms of, of mentorship, coaching, um, I am a coach, um, a, a qualified coach. I'm an integrative uh, nutrition health coach. I think about that a lot around midlife crisis. I think about it as midlife opportunity because I told you how my midlife, I was able to learn. I was able mm. to do so much more. Right? Um, so we don't always start in our 20s. I'll tell you that. Okay. Sometimes we just have to be obedient and do what we need to do. Learn, do the courses, do the jobs, stick in there, whatever you feel that energy to leave or to do something else. Pivot. Okay. Cause your allegiance, I believe your allegiance should be to yourself and your purpose in life, mm -hmm. not to a, a business. They can let you go. Like you can decide to leave tomorrow. So you have to think about how you're going to plant seeds because we're floating through life. We're just passing through. It's all about knowledge here. It's all about taking what you can get in terms of understanding your purpose, applying that purpose, leaving your mark. How will you leave your mark? What is your natural talent? That's going to tell you what your life purpose is. Mapping again, Cameron, like a broken racket. Map your life. You can figure out your purpose, right? Then doing that, it gives me a voice. My grandfather was a spoken, he was a poet. He, um, there's, um, actual audio of him doing, um, I think it's genuine, um, not genuine. I can't remember, but it's a, a religious thing. Um, religious, like, um, spoken word type of thing. They didn't call it spoken word back then, but, uh, he was telling the story and Lancelot Hayward. My cousin, I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, these Bermuda greats, um, as far as artists, um, and entertainers, but he was a pianist. And so they used to do a lot of work together. So I come from a line of vocalists. My brother is a, he writes rap. He's a rapper. He's well known in Bermuda combat. Um, but he has a, a bachelor's degree from Clark Atlanta in marketing. His, you know, his got he knows what he's talking about, you know? And so we're speakers. And once you understand your family dynamics too, where you come from, what makes your families, you run, perhaps, your family. You come from a line of runners from Africa. Who knows, right? <laughs> but understanding that gives you a voice. Now you can plant seeds to empower and inspire other people. My conversation is around managing your life, right? How do we stay present? How do we manage what I call the digital poly crisis? It's something that I've coined. It doesn't exist, but poly crisis does. If you if you're familiar, with poly, are you do you know poly crisis? Cam? I, I don't poly know. crisis is this idea of all of this global stuff happening, all this the all these things, right? We've got recession, you've got um you know political warfare, you've got cybersecurity, you've got all this stuff. <laughs> that is poly crisis. I coined the the um phrase digital. Or term digital body crisis, cybersecurity, data protection, AI, all of this stuff, careers. How do I manage this? I talk about mindful privacy. 
how do we get to a place of how do we manage our, our data online? You know, like I already put all this personal stuff on there. How do I manage this now? You know, people know this stuff about me. How do I deal with that? So I talk a lot about these topics, which, as you can tell from our conversation, it, it speaks to my life. It's, it's honest. I speak about art and technology. It's um, generative AI. I'm a certified generative AI expert. Um, I, prompting, you can imagine. Um, any writer should study prompting. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it is awesome. Engineering is very important. <laughs> a hundred, you know, and criminal justice. I'll go to this really quickly. I studied criminal justice. I thought I wanted to be a forensic psychologist. Criminal justice is the absolute core of understanding people. Every human being is one second away from committing the worst of a crime. We're all human. You never, ever know what could happen in life. And of course, I'm not a criminal and I'm not encouraging anyone to be a criminal. But if you want to understand human nature, study criminality, understand how people function with psychology and neuroscience, right? But studying criminal justice is beyond criminals. I wanted to understand where the rights are for criminals. Do they have rights? Just because you commit a crime. Are you still a person? That's why I wanted to study criminal justice. But take it further. It's about people. It's about ethics. It's about doing the right thing. It's about growing with technology, humanity and technology, arts and science. That is the core of who I am as an AI ethicist and a data protection professional. Especially like what you said at the end. It's about people, about that humanity of everything, just how it, it all really links together. And it actually does bring me to what I wanted to talk about, which was your reward. So for those who don't know, we're giving a quick congratulations, not a quick, a congratulations to Ms. Clark Dro because she recently got the awards, actually how I found out about her. She was one of the 100 brilliant women in AI ethics in Bermuda. So I'm really proud of her for that. So congratulations. Then nobody's clapping, but it's just me. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that experience, I suppose. So like you mentioned before, all of those things that you did, you know, doing your criminal justice degree, getting that arts bachelor, sorry, master's in arts, and then using it all throughout your career. I'm, I'm sure that, that all built up to you receiving that award. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about, I guess, that experience and how it felt when you realized like, even if that wasn't the moment, but that moment when you realize it's all coming together, like everything had a purpose and it was a step by step just leading me to this moment. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. It it, it still links to spirituality, to be fair, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> that links everything, spirituality for me. But um, yeah, um, I got the news of uh, that I was nominated with 600 women globally. And that I was nominated to, um, to, um, be featured on the list for 2024. It was during, um, a very difficult time for me. My grandmother, um, passed, uh, during that week. Um, I also finished the, um, first global AI leadership program for women, um, in the world. It's, it's an amazing program by Mission Impact Academy or MIA. Um, they are going to be running another cohort. I would encourage women and girls to get involved. There's people from all over the world. Uh, we explored metaverse. Um, I remember when I was in my thirties and I was, um, addicted to the Sims, you know, the Sims. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought I was the most weird person under the sun, but I was just so addicted. I would make excuses okay. to play all day and night. Well, if you've ever been in the metaverse. <laughs> It's basically the same thing. I'm See, point, the things that we get into, being yourself is everything, right? So the things that you love and all of that, it maps to create who you're meant to be, as I've said before. And so the week that I was finishing that program and that program, I sat on a um, social imp AI and social impact panel. Um, I was actually um, um, asked to join the program as a program, a leader, or like an advocate for the program. And it was amazing. I came into AI uh, ethics really through data protection, as I mentioned. I did a course. I did two courses at the same time. Lost my mind. I wouldn't encourage anyone to do it. London School of Political Science and Economics is not a school to play with. It's going to test your knowledge. It's going to test your skills, right? And so I did two courses at the same time, two certificates. One was in data, law, policy, and regulation. 
and the other was in the eth um, ethics in AI. And they were heavy hitting courses. They talked about regulation. They talked about politics. They talked about socioeconomic challenges in these spaces. And so, as you see, my introduction to AI was through that. In the one, that wasn't my full introduction. But um, again, you know, my, my real push for it to be a career um, and understand the low overlap was through data protection. By doing the global um, AI leadership program through NIA, I was introduced to generative AI. So now I was able to see AI in a more artsy, fun way, as opposed to, you know, um, let's have a look at the way that you've designed then. <laughs> that. Um, I was introduced, it just, it, it opened my mind. I, as a writer, set on um, almost started projects, tons of them. I've been able to finish projects because it's just really inspired me to to um, to repurpose some of them and, and really think about how AI and how the future um, is going to impact the world and the society that we live in. I think the foundation of the LSE um, courses together, it really formed a really solid understanding and footing in this space to now start leaning on my artsy side, right? Because I've, I've had years of working on that. Now I just need to know how the technology works with my art. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, understanding listen, that positions me to, again, follow my life's purpose now, right? I can understand how artsy people or more science, more, more um, scientific, more um, technical individuals could appreciate AI, how we need to have a voice in this space as women, as diverse individuals, um, why it's important whether you come in through arts or science or both. Why, you know, at what point are our voices important? What space should we hold in this space, in, in this um, industry? And so I think that a lot of that um, is what positions me to be a part of that list. So like I said, I found out uh, the day that I, the day after I graduated from the program, I, I got news of the list. And if I could be honest with you for the first, I would say first weekend, I found out on a Friday, that weekend I had imposter syndrome. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> you know, it's 100 people in the world and I make the list of 100. You know what? It had nothing at all, Cameron, to do with me personally or my achievements or accomplishments. For me, it had everything to do with the large stage that I now have, the voice, the, the responsibility that I have. Yes, as a, 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 lo a lady from a small island, 22 square miles <laughs> in Bermuda, um, to a woman in the world, you know, a, a, a voice in the world, a woman of, of, of color, you know, um, so many things I represent, right? Um, it's very much about using the tools that exists nowadays so that you can be productive and successful. AI powered tools allow you in many ways to be, to manage those things. <laughs> Whatever toolbox you have in life, you can start creating all that you need so that you can be successful. And AI is a great way to help to propel you into the future. I so agree. I liked what you were talking about before about having this, I guess, responsibility when you're bringing, bringing yourself, you know, as a woman of that self to the global stage. Um, I guess if I could go back, back to our island home, um, what impact would you say that AI would have in Bermuda? Because I'm, 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 I'm I might just be not knowing too much about it, but I know we've only recently just started getting into bringing more like AI based, I guess, programs and things in Bermuda. I'm not too sure what's available back home. Sorry, everyone. I, I haven't been back home quite a while, but. I would like to know what what impact do you think we've we've been having with AI in Bermuda? Like, what are we doing with AI back home? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, small the, the size of the jurisdiction does matter to some extent in terms of the adoption of newness. Um, but I think that uh, you know, you do have pockets or silos of uh, individuals and organizations that are trying their hand at it. Um, there, in terms of regulation, it, it is a bit slow. Regulation around the world is, <laughs> to me, feel, right? Um, and that's part of the challenge. 
Um, in terms of technological adoption, there are locals, Bermudians, that mm-hmm. are playing around with uh, generative AI as well as with the more technical sides of building um, systems, mm-hmm. you know, GPT systems and AI types of technology. Um, um, I have engaged with even um, entities outside of Bermuda that uh, are interested in perhaps uh, working um, with the population here uh, with certain types of devices and um, initiatives that will be AI powered. Um, so Bermuda is, is part of the world. I like to say that though we say Bermuda is another world, uh, we're not. As long as you go online, you're part of the world. <laughs> you're connected. <laughs> So we can't live with our head in the sand. We have to pay attention and be aware. Um, but there are some things that are being developed. I sit on um, a, a data team for the education reform um, with uh, the Ministry of, sorry, Department of Education. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, there's conversations around what innovation looks like in Bermuda. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a watch this space <laughs> type of situation. Um, but I think the conversations there, just like data protection, it takes a while for people to really wrap their heads around it. Um, the more that we talk about the harms, it scares people. But what I think is important is that a lot of stuff that we use already is using AI. We're already immersed in all AI functions. And whether so, we know it or not, <laughs> whether we know it or not, whether we want to or not, we are, and we won't stop using half of the things that we're comfortable with. So I think it really needs to be around how, you know, more awareness, of course, um, people feeling more comfortable and understanding how it connects the dot with what they're already doing. Um, I think a lot of that conversation will, will help to ease the implementation of an ethical and responsible AI um, um, la- landscape here in Bermuda. I so agree. Um, I guess to kind of close it out, because I know we've taken quite a bit of your time today, but I've really enjoyed the whole conversation, especially all the different nuggets that you were giving throughout it. But um, if I could finish off with just a little closing, I guess, quote really quickly from my grandfather, which you reminded me of, is that whenever I was growing up, you would always say, like, Numba, you're a citizen of the world. So I think that throughout your career, especially with, you know, going to London, that wonderful umbrella kind of opportunity that you had, and just being able to really branch out and bring not only yourself, but your your passions to wherever you went. I wanted to know if you had any just, I guess, closing words for students that maybe feel nervous about doing that, especially with the narrative being, you know, if you pick something, stick to it and just stick to that only. So if you had any, I guess, past finishing words for students that want to branch out a little bit more like you have. Please branch out. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Please. <perfect. laughs> Please do it. Um, you know, we're, we're evolving in so many ways. There was a time, um, industrial revolution, there was a time <laughs> when that was, was the narrative because that was the truth, right? You, you found what you could do and you stuck with it. Um, there wasn't a lot of space to change, but that's changing and change is the constant in our life, midlife crisis or opportunity, however you want to look at it. And you have one in 25, at 25 years of age, you have quarter life <laughs> crisis. And that's typically Cameron where a lot of young people feel like, oh my gosh, like, what is my voice? What do I stand for? You know, like, who am I in this world? Like, oh my gosh, what do you mean? I don't have my parents. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, be kind to yourself is number one. Okay, well, number one was do it. Just do it. Like, do it. Like, <laughs> that's number one. Number two, be kind to yourself, okay? Do that mapping. You see, I, I, I'm in my 40s, late 40s. I'm not ashamed to say I'm not one of those females. <laughs> and periodically, do an inventory, do a detox. Mm. Okay, go back, look at your skills. What are, what's transferable? Remember, you can't stay static in this day and age. You have to be agile. You have to be nimble. You have to do this in order to survive in this day and age and beyond. You you have to. Okay, it's not a matter of will machines take over our jobs. It's about us rem- remaining. True to who we are as a person, our skills, what we love to do, what makes us human, and understanding how AI can enhance, can can make us even more powerful. That's a superpower. Be okay with who you are. That's part of be kind to yourself. Be okay with every bit of who you are. 
the good and the bad. Okay. Because that helps you to really form an authentic message to other people. People can read you a mile away if you're being fake and they will show it at some point. Okay. You don't want to attract people who don't belong in your circle. You want to attract the right people and the right people are you showing up as yourself. <laughs> okay. People can invite you in and there's a difference between diversity and inclusion. Diversity, you can have a lot of different people in a room, but they don't feel included. It's like someone inviting you to the family, to the party, birthday party, but they don't talk to you. So they check the list. Oh, I've got a female there. Okay. I've got, I've got, uh, um, you know, a diverse person there, but oh no, we don't need to talk to them. I'd rather not be invited to the party than to sit there and feel uncomfortable. So, and, and you know what? I'll say this too. Go do something artsy. Yes. Whilst, of course, people think, oh, master, you have to do an MBA. You have to do that. That's okay. Go do it if that's what you want to do. But go and do a drama class, an impromptu class, a, a, a dance class, a, a singing class. Be silly. Take my advice. Be okay with not being okay. That's important to be inclusive as a leader. Be okay with everything going wrong in your life. Be okay with whatever you planned not happening. It's, that is a constant in life change. And so that's, that's what I would, I would say. Be prepared. We're in digital poly crisis. Um, it's not going to go away. It's about mindful privacy. It's about holism. It's about, um, understanding, you know, what you're okay with in your personal life or in the physical world. Then think about that. It needs to mirror that in, in, in your cyber world. So if you don't, if you're not friendly, then don't be friendly online. <laughs> if, if you don't hand over your, your baby to anyone walking by, then don't expose your little one to cyber world without any guidance. So that's what I say, right? Cause some young people, I was 22 with a baby. Some young people in uni might have a child. So I'm being real. And some are non-traditional students. I was right. And so the reality is online just navigate it the same way that you would do physical and you'll be okay. But all of these things, the digital poly crisis, do not ignore it. Figure out your space and your toolbox. What tools do you need to be successful and to follow your life's purpose? Thank you so, so much, especially for all those wonderful nuggets. I, I hope you were taking notes. I was taking notes along the way. So thank you so much, Ms. Clark Trill, for your time. I hope everyone enjoyed the episode. I really enjoyed my time with you. So thank you again for joining me. Really enjoyed it. Hi again, awesome listener. That wraps up another deep dive of Cameron's Lab. Dive in. Before you dive back into your day, see what I did there? Take a second to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Want a behind-the-scenes look? Bonus content? Or just some good old STEM fun? Follow me on my socials, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Cameron's Lab. And remember, every episode is a new adventure, and we've got some really dives lined up for you. Don't miss out! Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring.